Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Amanda Coe, and I am a professor of Chemistry <coughs> 304, uh, Fluid Flow Operations. So I'm in the College of Engineering. I teach chemical engineering, which is an interesting uh, place for learning and action for e experiential learning. It's uh, not quite as common. Mm -hmm. um, so I really t uh, enjoyed the opportunity to be able to bring this into my class. So basically, what do I teach? I teach fluid mechanics. Fluid mechanics is one of these really big pillars of engineering. Almost every single engineering major will take some sort of fluid mechanics. For chemical engineers, uh, they used to kind of call chemical engineers glorified uh, plumbers, and that was because of this class. Um, you learn a lot about pipes. You learn a lot about fluid flow in pipes. However, now pipes can not just mean uh, going through your walls. It can mean making chemicals. It can mean the pipes in your body, meaning your, your veins, your arteries, things like that. So it's really one of these fundamental pillars of chemical engineering and engineering in general. And generally what I was looking for for this ELO was to be able to take the concepts we learn in lecture and how do they actually work in the real world. Because chemical engineering right now, it's a very big program. I think we actually are the third largest chemical engineering department in the country. So we really have one lab class uh, in kind of your entire major. It's this giant scary thing you do in your junior, junior summer. It's like the dreaded thing, um, which is unfortunate because for me, when I was in undergrad, labs were amazing. It's where you really learned what you were doing, where you applied what you were learning. So I want to try to bring a little bit of that into my class. So basically what I did is I designed an experiment that these students could do that directly related to what we had in class. It actually came into my lab. Uh, we have a little piece of equipment that we were going to use. And basically, how do we use the lecture concepts to do something <coughs> in class? And basically, what we decided to do, and I think I, let's see if I can do this more in the next class. Yeah, is that I give them three fluids. So these are all three fluids that are either food or office supplies, something you would work with in your everyday life. They're not told what this fluid is. And basically they have to use an industrial piece of equipment, so something they would see on the end of a process line, something they could actually use on the job, something they could put on their resume even to say that they have experience working with it. Using that, they basically have to measure viscosity of these three fluids. So basically, they have to, they're going to take observations. So if you want to be a good scientist, good engineer, you know, what does it look like? What does it smell like to some extent? Uh, what do you think it is? Some of these people come in like, that's that. I'm like, oh, I'm not going to tell you. I need to see evidence of what you think it is. Uh, but the types of fluids that we're looking at are honey, Elmer's glue, clear Elmer's glue to make it slightly more complicated, <laughs> uh, ketchup, mayonnaise, uh, hand soap, and olive oil. So they come into, the, they come into my lab a functioning chemical engineering research lab. They use this piece of equipment that specifically be, uh, is a quality control piece of, uh, of equipment, so they can really beat against it. <laughs> it's not the kind of thing that's too delicate. You, if the undergrad like, you know, smashes it a little bit, it's still okay. Um, and they take viscosity. They, there's a lab uh, sheet. I kind of run through the background of it. I run through what they're supposed to do. It's a little, uh, there's times where they have to figure out kind of what is the next step. I'm there for the whole thing, so if they have questions, they can feel free to ask. They have to choose kind of what speed they're running the instrument at. But this is basically, they run through this experiment, they run these three, uh, these three fluids, and they have to be, the question, the point of the experiment is, what is this fluid? So they come into the lab, they say, that's ketchup. Like, that's obviously ketchup. You see a goopy red thing, it smells like tomato. Maybe it's ketchup. But what I need is for them to not only see that it looks like ketchup, that it's red, that it's goopy, all of that, they have to take the measurements, they have to go into the literature and find other people who have measured ketchup. And they have to recognize, how do I take the data that I've gotten in lab, relate it to what people have done in the literature, what people have done before, and then make an argument of why this is definitely ketchup, why this is definitely mayonnaise, why this is definitely olive oil, blah, 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 blah. Based on whatever they learned in class of viscosity, of Newtonian fluids, of non-Newtonian fluids, shear rate, all of this. And what I really wanted is that when we talk about viscosity in class, it's this thing that you kind of really understand fundamentally, you know, something is thick, something is thin. But when you learn the mechanics of it, you really learn the physics of it, we actually, in the top right, that's the picture that we have for them. These two parallel plates with some fluid going in between, there's forces, there's shear rates. This does not necessarily jive with what you think of as viscosity. So how do you take this picture and how do you actually relate it to what viscosity really is? How do you relate it to how you really measure viscosity? And that was really what I was hoping for, is that you take these really kind of esoteric diagrams, on exams, I always have them draw a schematic. Always, always, always. Step one is you have a problem, draw a schematic. But what does that actually look like in real life? So that was kind of the big part of what I wanted to do in this class, is relate the lecture concepts to something that you have some kind of basic understanding of, and also be able to relate these schematics that I make you draw for all of your exams anyway. What does this really look like in real life? 
and also try to make this somewhat open-ended. Uh, we talked about in kind of the learning about experiential learning, this fear of failure, that you have to give students kind of an opportunity to fail. And typical lab experiments for chemistry and things like that, you do step A, you do step B, you do step C, you know what the answer is supposed to be. Here, they don't necessarily know what the answer is supposed to be. How do the students like that? We'll find out uh, how, uh, how much they respond to that. Some of them, from their pre-reflections, have already said, this is scary, uh, a decent amount of my grade for this is based on me identifying the fluid properly. Some of them are, this is great, I like that I actually don't have a prescribed ending. The way that I am running this, which I think is nice, is that the lab report is due at the very end of the semester. Basically what they can do is tell me what they think the fluid is, so give me the reasons, and if you're right, I'll tell you you're right. If you're wrong, I'll say this is the direction you should be going in. Basically give them an opportunity to have a feedback loop so that they're not just going to this blind and just worry they're going to fail because they didn't identify this fluid properly. But I still want them to get the experience of having to figure out what this fluid is based on the data, based on the literature, based on what they did in class. So, so what I kind of really want from this ELO, I want them to be able to visualize what it is they're really doing in lecture, not just drawing a 2D picture of a tank and a pipe or drawing two parallel plates and what the fluid looks like in between. I want them to be able to say, this is what the, what the problem is, this is how you would draw a schematic of it, and this is what it really looks like in real life. Because I think for engineers, you become an engineer because you want to build something, you want to put your hands on it, you want to really get into it. And I am not an artist, I cannot draw, I am terrible at that, my schematics are not pretty, but they directly relate to what it's supposed to be like in real life. And when you go between a problem, a schematic, if you can have that picture in your head, you are so much better able to understand what it is you're doing, and that when I hear a lot from my students, you know, I saw this problem, I didn't know how to get started. I know how to do the math, my students are all very smart, they can do calculus, they can do the arithmetic, that isn't the issue. It's how do I go from numbers on a page to what does this actually look like? What is this actually supposed to do? And my hope is that really kind of getting this jump between lecture and the experiment, that this is going to enable students to be able to do this. Ooh, I need to go faster. So I want them to be able to <laughs> manipulate the math, I want them to kind of work through these problems. It's really exciting to kind of see students make these connections, which is nice. I also, a big thing for me, is be able to connect what we're doing in lecture to what the state of the art is. Fluid mechanics is not new. People have been doing mechanics for centuries. So how do you get a student to recognize this is not something that's done? That is, you know, we figured everything out 300 years ago. So by looking in the literature, the fact that the people still care about what the viscosity of ketchup is. One of the things I talk about at the beginning of my class, there is an actual fluid mechanics definition of fancy ketchup. <laughs> it is not something that's just on labels. There is a specific density that's required. How much tomato salad there is in your ketchup versus water. Which is super cool. Like, you wouldn't, this is, there's all kinds of fancy labels and everything, right? But this is a fluid mechanics thing that is directly related to ketchup. So, I think it's really nice to have students kind of connect with that. And, so, and this is somewhat, uh, somewhat repeating myself. Basically, I want them to be able to take an open-ended problem. I want them to be able to visualize what's going on. And I think in doing so, it really allows them to connect what it's supposed to look like, what it looks like in real life, how do I do these problems, and then once they have this picture, students are so much better able to solve these problems, to work through the steps. Because like I said, they can do the math, but once they have that picture in their head, what this is really supposed to look like, doing an experiment like this, I really think it's the kind of opportunity that allows them to go through problem solving and really work through this. And I hope that they really can take this to all of their classes. To how, what does this system really look like? Not just kind of take a textbook, a schematic on face value, but what is this really going to look like on the job, when I do this after I graduate, when I want to go home and I want to figure out how do I get the honey out of the bottle? Like, this is all real stuff they're going to be working on. And uh, so they do have to do a lab report they have to tell me kind of what is viscosity, how do I relate this to lecture, uh, what is currently going on in the literature, all this kind of stuff to basically work through. I want to I want to see what you thought, but I take observation of what did it smell like, what did it look like, all kind of taking everything together, making engineering not just this really esoteric thing, something that you can deal with in your everyday life. You don't become an engineer for high, like, lofty goals, maybe, and maybe you do, but it's also because you like to build something at home. You like to squish something. You like to see how something works. That's what engineers are all about. And being able to relate that to what we do in lecture and being able to put that on a page is also going to be really important. And so I want them to be able to make the connections, sort through all the possible fluid research. There's lots of stuff out there, which is also a really useful skill. I think the students have so far responded really well to this. I'm about halfway through the experiments. We'll see how the, all those lab reports go. Maybe they'll be less excited once they have to put everything on paper. Um, but so far, I think it's gone really well. Uh, the biggest 
thing that I'm going that I kind of worry about going forward. I'm really lucky to have a small class this semester. So my class is only actually 25. Normally my class last semester was 80. So I don't know how this would kind of really scale well to a larger class. Um, that's something that I'd like to kind of look into. Um, can it be applied to other class concepts? How do I kind of deal with that in terms of timing? The biggest thing other than just kind of working about the, the uh, size of the class though, is that I see in lab the, the top student gets it. They make the connection between lecture and the concept, no problem. Middle of the class student, also like, oh, this is what I'm actually working on, but I do these pictures, this is what it looks like. When you take a student who's maybe struggling in the class, someone who's maybe in that bottom third, how do you get that student to get the same, am same amount out of this lab as all the other students? How do you get them to make that connection? Especially when this is a one and done kind of thing. They come into the lab, it's an hour, they leave. How do you get that student to still make the same connections that the other two thirds of the class kind of is able to do already? Okay, so I'm going to talk about a class that I just implemented um, in the spring. And I happen to be teaching again this fall, which is unusual because I've taught it in the spring for the past four years. So it's not a new class, but I changed some things for this last spring that I think went really well. So this is a, it's called Child Mental Health Theory and Field Experience. It's for upper level psychology majors. Occasionally I take a non-psychology major who's done a lot of psychology coursework. Um, but they have to apply and interview to get into the class. So I have a nice self-selected sample of my <laughs> chief being very motivated students. Um, who want to pursue some career in child mental health. Um, and I usually have about 15 or so students, so it's a small class. Um, so this is just a brief overview of my course. They, we have weekly course lecture discussion. I do this, I actually have just one long section. It's like two and a half hours, so it's fun. It's fun <laughs> for me every week. <laughs> Uh, where we talk about things like ethics, different mental health settings, practical issues and barriers to mental health treatment, in addition to the more standard like childhood psychopathology and treatment. Um, some of that they've already gotten from other courses, so I'm trying to focus more on the real world issues and how those things can apply. Um, I also have lots of guest lectures and guest speakers from the community. I have a few people come from UA, but in more like non-traditional roles, because they see a lot of people who are tenure track academics, um, they've already met and had most of those people for professors. So I'm getting people who have more, maybe more clinical roles. Um, I get people with a variety of graduate training, jobs, um, different populations that they work with. And it's, I think it's really one of the highlights of the class. I, I also like hearing from it, from the guest speakers. And then the other major component of the class where the experiential learning is focused is at Brewer Porch Children's Center, which is a facility um, out past the Tuscaloosa VA. Um, some of y'all have heard of it before. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I've talked about this before too. Uh, so it has seven residential and intensive outpatient treatment programs. Some of those are in flux right now, um, but my students go out there once a week and shadow and observe for a couple hours, and then over time they get to hang out with one group of kids a little bit more and mentor them so they get to be close with them. At the end of the semester, they do a, they lead an activity with the, the, a group of the kids. So it could be um, where they're teaching them how to make, I think last semester, somebody had stress balls they made for the kids, which was very fun and extremely messy. Um, <laughs> or they lead them in some type of like Olympic challenge where they have to do different activities. So it's, it's really fun and they like it. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So these are some pictures of her porch. It looks like a pretty typical facility, and it has, this would be an example of um, a kid's room, and the gym, and the classroom. Okay, so these are my learning outcomes based on the ELO. Um, if anybody wants to see my arts and sciences matrix, I have it with how I Ooh. specifically <laughs> measure and address. I didn't put it up on the slides. All of these things, um, but I think I do a pretty good job based, based on the matrix. So I want them to be able to apply ethical standards, not only to know them, which none of them uh, so far in my class have ever heard of the ethical standards or what they are, so we actually study them and are tested on them at the beginning of class, but then they have to apply them and think about 
what type of ethical dilemmas are coming up. Ethical dilemmas don't have to be major crises. They happen all the time in mental health. So how they're thinking about conflicts between two ethical standards, two or more. Um, I want them to be able to synthesize literature and mentoring relationships and, and apply that. So that's some of their first experiences out there. Wow, this is really different when I was actually interacting with the kid. How, you know, how am I responding to them? How am I framing my time out here for the kid and how is that going to be beneficial for the kids? Um, I want them to, be, to evaluate careers in child mental health. This is something we thought was really important for this course as a department. For there's so we have so many psychology majors and so many of them want to go into mental health fields, but they don't know where to go because there's only a small percentage of them that are going to go on to do a PhD in clinical psychology. Um, so I have that's part of why I have lots of uh, diversity of guest speakers, um, but we also just talk about different settings, different types of graduate training you could go to. I often end up helping them lots with their, with thinking about what types of programs they're going to apply to, and I even do rec letter, lots of rec letters. Um, I want them to be able to classify common um, child mental health issues and to put what they're seeing in certain kids' behaviors into to try to think about and conceptualize what that might be, um, and recognizing evidence-based practices in treatment. So what types of things are they seeing that might be evidence-based, what is not? Okay, so these are the, the key things that I think helps my students develop problem-solving skills. Um, so the mentoring that they get to do with the child clients, um, they actually end up assisting the kids with problem solving. So kids have problems all the time. And it's often a social problem where they, we talk explicitly about problem solving model and steps to work through. So they could work through that on their own if they have their own problems out there, which I'll talk about in a second, but they often um, will help the kids talk through that problem that the kid is having. Um, and how to balance that with empathy and support um, instead of just telling them what to do, which we know doesn't usually work. We just tell kids what to do. Um, they're also exposed to challenging ethical situations. So Brewer Porch, like most places, um, most mental health facilities, is underfunded in some ways. And so there are all sorts of um, challenging situations that come up with that. So sometimes staff members can behave inappropriately. I'm not necessarily talking about like egregious and inappropriate behavior, but maybe yelling at a kid or something like that. Um, and how my students handle that. Um, they also get lots of personal questions from children and they have to decide there's not necessarily like a black and white answer to what's an appropriate question to answer, what's not. So they have to think through where the boundary is and how they're going to respond and is that beneficial or harmful for a kid. Um, when they do this group activity with the kids at the end of the semester, they have to practice group behavior management. We are not really interested in, in what type of skill they're teaching the kid. I don't really care if they teach them how to make stress balls or teach them how to you know, do a dance. Um, I want to see how they're uh, able to use behavior management in a group and some of the strategies that we've talked about. So a new thing that I did in this past semester that I hadn't done before is given them the opportunity to do the activity twice so that they could practice and learn from it and then me and the director will give them feedback on how they did and some things that they could try. And then they did the same activity, um, usually with a different group of kids and it, went a lot better the second time around. So it was great. It was a good opportunity for them to practice behavior management. Um, and then finally, career decisions. So this is a major problem. This is a life problem solving <laughs> skill, thinking about careers. Um, so they really critically evaluate the readings that we have and guest speaker info. Um, I have them do reflections, which I'll talk about in a second, every single week. And so they, I have them talk about what they're doing at Brewer Porch and their mentoring and problem solving out there, but they also, I have them specifically address in a couple of reflections what they're thinking about that, their career, how that's been solidified or changed, um, and what they're seeing. And I, anecdotally, most of them talk to me about this all the time and um, 
have lots of questions for me and our guest speakers about what they're hearing in terms of just the logistics, even of applying or what the program the programs they might be looking at look like. Okay, so I mentioned reflections. I have them do weekly reflections on their experience, and I have these synthesized with course readings and discussion. Uh, this is something I really targeted to improve in this past semester. Heather and I talked about this a lot before. I was having a lot of variability in reflection quality. Um, so previously, I would have students who were just great at writing reflections, and they'd talk about how you know this thing that they read in the in the readings was really related to what they were seeing out here, and it tied in with something the guest speaker said about financial barriers. <laughs> and then I'd have other students that would just say, "So this week I went to her porch." and we watched the kids eat lunch, and then we went to classroom or something like that. So I worked really hard to make some specific reflection prompts so they would have choice. I didn't want them to have an assigned prompt per week because different, people, different students will see different things in different weeks. So they choose um, with a list that I have with has lots of like detailed prompt questions. Um, to address those specific things. And I think it's really brought up the level of reflection quality. Something else I've done is given some exemplar reflections and posted on Blackboard, and also talked with them a lot at the beginning of the semester of what I'd like to see and why reflections are important, not just because I want to give them a grade for it, but how that's, I think, the thing that helps them learn the most and get the most out of their experience that they're having. Um, so they get to guide the children in the group activity, and I kind of already mentioned this, they get two opportunities and they're given feedback. And then finally they write a research paper at the end of the semester. Um, they can pick any topic, I want them to pick a topic that they're interested in, um, that might relate to something they want to do in the future. Um, so I give them pretty wide latitude as long as it relates to child mental health. I've had kids, uh, students write about specific disorders and treat the treatment of that disorder in a residential facility, but I've also had students write about insurance barrier. So it's, I think it's really interesting. Um, and it has to stem in some way from their experience. And then they look, they look into the research more on that area. So finally, these are kind of like, I, this is, so now I'm teaching it for I think the fifth time. Um, these are kind of my ongoing challenges and questions. Um, Increasing class participation. So this past semester, in my, the semester that I implemented this, I had a particularly quiet class. Um, I had not had that before. It's such a small class and they're, they're all really interested in the area, so I just hadn't had a like, shy class. But I was having a really hard time with them speaking up in, in our discussion. So I ended up breaking them into small groups a lot more and that increased their participation. Um, I have continued to do that this semester, even though this semester I have a really talkative class again. Um, but I do think they, they get a lot out of the smaller group discussions. Um, so that's something I think I'll continue to do. And then just ensuring similar experiences. I don't think there's any way I could ensure that people have the exact same experience, um, and I wouldn't want that. Um, but things that always come up are we have, you know, we have to kind of develop rotation schedules around the needs of the facility, the availability of supervisors out there, as well as the student's own availability. Most of my students are really high achieving. They're involved in lots of different things. It's kind of complicated to come up with their um, observation schedules. So sometimes things happen like, oh, they go there, but the kids are watching a movie the whole time that they're there. So we try to like make sure that they can rotate and see different things and get different experiences. Um, but that's kind of an always logistical challenge. All right. And I will save the questions for later. I'm, my name is Brooke Champagne, and I will be talking about my English 305 course, which I taught last spring. Um, it's creative nonfiction writing. This is an intermediate course within creative writing. And um, I guess I wanted to, before we start with the slides really, I wanted to talk about why I decided to embark on this with, with Heather and, and, and our cohort. With this, with basically with creative writing in general, um, there's what I like to call the dead grandmother problem, which is that when students, especially I think at the, this, the level that we're talking about here, which is 
students feel like I'm 18, 19, 20 years old, I'm coming to do creative writing, and nonfiction writing, writing about the self, they have to write about whatever trauma they've had in their 18, 19 years. Um, hopefully, they haven't had anything much beyond the dead grandmother. Some of them have, I mean, for sure. But what we end up getting often is just trauma writing. By the way, there is nothing wrong with that. That is, that, that, that's, that's fine. But I wanted students, and I guess I've, I've been teaching now for 15 years, so I thought, let, there's, there's other options out there, particularly for nonfiction writing. I myself am a memoirist, and I write personal essays as well, sometimes about trauma. I like to make my trauma funny, um, <laughs> uh, which is, what you know, <laughs> another discussion. But so what, <laughs> what, what we wanted, what I wanted to do is try an immersive project. Have students, so I, I think I'll go to the, the slide here. Um, I'd, I, I talked with a colleague about this Morgan Spurlock documentary series, which maybe you've heard of, which is called 30 Days, in which um, the Morgan Spurlock himself will immerse in a community that's very unlike himself, that doesn't like really follow his system of belief. Um, he'll do that for 30 days. So what I thought I could do with students is have them think about nonfiction writing as something that they can, that, that's not necessarily about the self, that's something really foreign to their experience. So my idea was have them immerse in a community that is, th that's not your community. Um, so some examples of this, well, here, the 30 days, I kind of split it up, 90 days. I know a semester's a little bit longer than that, but you know, give or take 30 days researching their potential topic, 30 days immersing in it completely, and then 30 days reflecting um, what's interesting about this is that they kind of did all of these, all three of these things throughout the semester. You're researching even as you're immersing, even as you're reflecting. You're reflecting early on as well. Um, but some examples of the ones, I, I taught this course in the spring. Um, some examples were a pacifist uh, joined a boxing club. Environmentalists interviewed uh, an executive at Big Oil. An atheist uh, went, returned to church. Um, these are some examples of more what I wanted, which was like a concrete community, um, like actually immersing in something that's some kind of some kind of group. Um, it's also I, I thought it would be worth saying that even the students who didn't have a concrete community to to um, immerse with had a lot of success. I had one student who was a self-described introvert, and he said, I, you know, I want to do something different. I want to like really try to be an extrovert. <laughs> like I want to just see what that's like. I want to try it. So he did some research on like you know what what are the what what is the difference between introversion and extroversion, and actually found out something that I think I've known all along because I think I'm a, a combination of these things that there's introversion, extroversion, and then in the obverse. And so he just like would you know decided that when he would go to the grocery store he would talk to the cashier instead of just like, you know, cowering away like he usually did. And anyway, the, this wasn't a community that he immersed in, but he still felt like what he did really changed his life. It was really, it was interesting. I'll talk more about that later. Um, so that's kind of the basis of the cl class. Um, at the end of the course, students worked on a website to share their work. Um, I'll talk more about that later. Um, some important student outcomes. So. Just, I mean, you can see this here. This is a writing course, so um, one of the things that I, I don't think it's stressed enough in creative writing courses. I think that there's this idea that it's just all, hey man, we're just, you know, writing our feelings. Um, and <laughs> I wanted it to, you know, creative writing, writing when it's good is rigorous. It is, it's a process, it's work, it, you know, everyone in here I'm sure is a writer in his or her own way. It's hard. Um, so the, we have to learn research. We have to learn the process. Another thing that I think intermediate students often um, don't understand is that first thought is not best thought. <laughs> like we, the, like drafts are are, are um, essential. We talk about that at, at the first year writing level, but I think creative writing students they're they're at another level. They've always considered themselves writers, most of them. Um, so they just feel like, hey, I, I wrote this. It's good. It's not. Um, so, <laughs> so, so, so process. Um, reflection, which is a big part of all experiential learning courses, um, we spend a lot of time with that. And the, the big thing, I think, for me, too, because I'm by no means an expert in it, is grappling with technology to construct an outward-facing 
facing writing projects. So taking the workshop basically outside of the classroom is a, was another goal of mine. Um, in creative writing, we're all we're just like a close knit little group here, and we share our work with each other. But like, what does publication mean at, at this level when you're maybe not ready to be in the New Yorker, but you still you still have work to share? And so that's that that's what that website that we constructed was all about. Um, and I meant to say, put links to that here. I will add that to this if that's I, I have I have some links um, to some of their websites. Um, so how th this will assist in their problem solving skills? Well, I think particularly with this course, if I'm having them immerse in, I, that's kind of the essential to, to this course. If you're dealing with communities that are unlike you, how do you, how do you do that? How do you, and then I also had students who um, tried to immerse in a community and it didn't work for, some, for whatever reason. So like trying to figure out, I've started on this project, how do I finish it if I'm getting people who don't necessarily want to help me with this. Um, that's, that, was, that was kind of a big issue. Um, also, collaborating with peers to improve writing um, and get feedback or assistance with research, that was really great. So all these intercommunication skills, um, which is, by the way, important for anyone who's gonna take a creative writing co course. I, I do wanna say here, I meant to say at the beginning, these aren't all necessarily English majors. This is a, a writing um, elective, so I, I've got a lot of business people um, there's engineers, there's lots of telecommunication films, so there's, we have um, like a wide swath here. Um, and also, this is a big one for me, it's a big one for me personally, and this is why I love to teach it in the course, writing your research. I've, I, there's making your research seamlessly fit into a narrative. I've, this is what I struggle with in teaching first year writing classes for over the last 15 years, and it's, it's really still an issue in creative writing. There's like, I'm telling my story, I'm telling my story, oh look, here's like, I'm gonna go into a research paper here for, for this section, now I'm back to my story. So a, a lot of what we worked with is, mm, let's try to avoid that, and how, how do we um, make that work more seamlessly there? Um, connections between the ELO and assessment. Um, so it's, it's kind of typical, the typical assessments that I would do in any creative writing course, um, the writing and workshop critique assessments, depending on the, the was dependent on the quality, depth, and completion of their immer their immersion. So one thing that was different was they had to have a week weekly journal check-ins, which I just set up basically a journal through Blackboard to have them to basically to make sure like what is it that you're doing. It didn't always have to be like, okay, I'm out in the community talking with people, but like, what are the questions you're thinking about? What did you read about introversion or extroversion this week? So we had, that was part of the assessment. Um, and then also the website, which is something that, um, you know, is really a culmination of all the work. And they basically put almost all of the work they did throughout the semester into that. Okay. Um, this slide, this could be five slides. Um, so I'm just, the remaining challenges and ongoing questions, as I was talking to Heather earlier, this course was really successful for a whole lot of reasons, but I, I think it also, you know, maybe, I don't know. I think, I think it could also, it, it also use some work. Um, with, with this website in particular, I wanted it to be something more, I mean, they created a website and that was great, but like, now what? You know what I mean? Like, what, what do we do with that? I kind of wanted it to be maybe part of some kind of, like, display project, something, something that, like, we could actually invite community members into. Um, now, this course was 12 students large, so that makes it, you know, we've, we've done sort of website poster presentation kind of things with first-year writing when there are, like, hundreds of students involved. So you can get, like, an audience. With 12, I kind of am not sure what to do with that. Um, also, this is a kind of a big deal. I love the idea of doing a website because it gives students sort of autonomy and they're building something, they're self-publishing, and that's all great for a writer. But thinking long-term, I mean, I know they're still young, but some of them take their writing really seriously. If it's published on the website, even, even through Taskstream, there are questions of, is this potentially publishable outside of this later on? And that's that sort of, that, is it copyright? I, I forget the terminology, I, I don't know. But you just have to um, consider that. If the, the work they're doing, they want to publish somewhere else, that work should not be on a website. So that's a question that I still have. Um, 
Also, this was a big thing, how to accommodate students dealing with anxiety um, and having to do field work. Like, I'm asking them, I, and by the way, I want to say this now. I realize that what I asked of them was super hard, <laughs> like, in a way. Like, they immerse in a community that you don't know anyone, that you are feel uncomfortable, that, you know, that's, that's a lot. I told them that I was going to do it, and you know what? I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. I kind of did a. I did a version of it. I said I was initially going to immerse with. Um, I was going to interview some students with uh, a particular group on campus. Was it a political affiliation? I'm not going to say what they are, but that uh, disturbed me. Um, but I was pregnant and I didn't want to do it. So I did. I was like, although that would have been a good disarming time to to do. You know, walk in pregnant and be like. <laughs> What's up, kids? Um, but instead, I, my community that I chose is I chose not to curse for 30 days. That's part of my vocabulary since I can remember. Um, so it, it was interesting, but it was also not a concrete immersion thing as well. So I, I can understand that asking them to do that is a lot. Um, so how do you deal with students who have that issue? I, I, I worked at that, uh, well, I had the student who was the introvert who was like basically did not want to talk in class at all. And I have to say, that was such a big success story with that particular student, because by the end, he was like, he wrote a poem for the class. Like he just, he, he, he asked to like, he asked to read aloud when, you, he just volunteered. And he basically, I mean, he told me at the end of class, he was like, that really working on this did change who I am. I was like, God, I got one. <laughs> that's, that's all I mean. that's, that's it. Um, so, um, yeah, oh, also, you know, some of these students went with a subject that didn't necessarily, then like they kind of got sick of it or whatever. How, how to deal with that when we're basically, you kind of need to get the ball rolling at the beginning of the semester with a project that this is this like in, in depth. So that is all I have. Thank you. What do I want them to have done by what what point? Especially when you're like doing 30 days, 30 days, you know, like meeting out these um, fence posts, I guess. So I think like fence posting, it's, it's different than just saying, you're just writing and you have like three major essays due throughout the semester. I had to really think how they were accomplishing. And, and that was hard for me because I, I didn't really know what I wanted that what I wanted to be done by what point. So that was one thing for me. I think my probably biggest barrier is boring one just time. Um, some of the extra stuff I added in or like doing more activities um, meant that I went out there much more. I, I can't go out there every time because um, that just would not fit into my week. But so it's things like that. Once you hand the keys over to the students, then you've got to have things planned out for. You can't adjust like you do in your lecture. Yeah. I think a, a consistent theme across the experiential learning opportunity courses is the logistics. Mm -hmm. And, you know, y'all are really strong pedagogically. Managing the logistics of doing the thing. Um, which could involve the number of students. Mm -hmm. It could involve the, um, the time frames, for example, being at Brewer's Porch and kind of having to have it, the things done in a specific space relative to our semester and what's going on at Brewer's Porch might not, the time frames of what goes on programmatic wise there might not necessarily match up with our semester. Um, or like you're talking about, you know, getting students started. Um, in some ways, they kind of had a placement, right? I mean, they were placing themselves yeah. in, in the community, but how do you manage the, that process and provide support for them in thinking about where they're going to be mm -hmm. and how they're going to orient themselves to that, um, I think, some of our other presenters might also have something to say about the logistics question. I guess um, for me, I'm wondering what 
can the institution do, if anything, to assist with working through those logistics questions and challenges? Give me money. <laughs> I don't know what I'll do with it. I'll figure that out. <laughs> oh, is that grad student time? Grad student time. I'd take a grad student for a little bit of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's actually, that, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. oh. For me, I'm, I'm going to put a pin in that because that's, that's I, need to, I need to think about that because institutional, I haven't thought of, which I should have thought about that um, ahead of time, but that's, yeah, I think, because what I, for this project in particular, it's something that I, and I told them, this, you don't need to leave campus in order to do this. Um, there's just so many groups, it, whether they're actually form student clubs or, you know, the kids who hang out in the quad and throw frisbee, you know, like there's just, you can, you can find this anywhere. Um, so you, you can find a group anywhere. So I, yeah, I, I'm not sure what I could ask the institution to do, uh, but that's, that's a good question to think about. Mm -hmm. Another kind of macro question that I have is, um, um, oh shoot, I lost it, hold on, Sorry. it's coming back, it's coming back. Mm -hmm. Resources, oh, got it. So um, even though the scholarship of teaching and learning isn't a part of the QEP in terms of you know, what the institution is about, you know, in terms of um, enhancing student learning or the environments that support student learning. For you all as faculty, be involved in producing scholarship about all areas of your practice is potentially really important. One of the questions I have is, what is the easiest, most efficient way to embed data collection and analysis in the thing itself so that it's a natural part of the work and not an add-on. In the same way that we might think of doing that for students, if we you know, adjust things and put in an experiential learning component so that it's not like, okay, you're gonna do all the regular work and then you're gonna do this extra thing. We wanna make it you know, embedded in a, in a natural way. Is there a way to embed research activities like the methodological piece, the data collection, the analysis, within the doing of the thing? And maybe that's not a question that you all can answer right now, but if you have any initial ideas about it, I think that would be really helpful for the cohorts that are going through right now and maybe the one that's going to start in the spring. Are you thinking kind of like the test stream collections or other Sure, you know, using using what we're collecting as data, but you know, what we collect for the QEP is so specific, mm -hmm. um, and so questions, the authentic questions that you have about your practice, mm -hmm. about your pedagogy, about student learning in your course, and how might we embed opportunities for collecting data in those in the course of doing mm -hmm. your work with students that would allow you to more easily write about it and publish on it. Make IRB much easier. <laughs> <laughs> Arvin and I submitted an IRB this semester. I, I know one answer for me. Get my city training done more quickly is one answer to that question. Oh, I still have like 10 other questions I have to answer from the rejection stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I guess maybe having a policy or some sort of blanket policy for this very specific type of work that IRB is aware of that we're not, you know, dripping chemicals on students and that kind of stuff. Because, um, yeah, one of the comments was I didn't list all the radiation hazards associated with one, not this one, another one. I'm just asking students like three questions. Uh, so having like almost a a template within the IRB system for this experiential learning stuff when you're just asking your class, like as part of the process, just survey question. Mm -hmm. As you were talking, was uh, Berkeley talked about 
what is that end product like, that website? And I think right now you're thinking about putting the end, like the students work up there, right? Uh, but what struck me about most of the presentations is that there's the product, but there's also the process, right? Um, and so I wondered if, if you focused on highlighting the process, that you wouldn't kind of deal with any of those publication things and later on. And the reason why I thought about that in your question was, to what extent could you partner with another experiential project, whereas like yours is about immersing, reflecting, creating a, a non-fiction piece out of that. And maybe Susan's class is more about actually work, our job is to highlight the work that's being done here, and, and, and her class is more about like, to go talk to these students that are doing this, what are they doing, and, then, and, and in her class, their end product is actually a video, a one minute video around like Kwok, and what he did in this community. And so you could then, she gets her students in, I get an end product for my website. Oh. And, and so it's like, yeah. and to your point about the, how do you make it seamless so not like, try to collect data upon data, right? Because when I read all my collections, I'm thinking, what the heck do I do with this yeah. now, right? <laughs> but maybe that's a way to do it because now I've got a product from her class which is really about the process and that's what I want. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. kind of, I love that idea, that's, that's what I thought. That collaboration, I mean, we're collaborating within the course, but yeah. I like the idea of collaborating externally as well. So that would be. And of course, it's complicated, but it's just like yes. if we could set that up, then, yeah. then, then you're supporting each other, right? Yeah, yeah, I love that idea. One thing that came up as, as an example, and, and this is for everybody, because I think all of us are involved in teaching and learning in different ways. Um, so one of the current fellows uh, was talking about reading a particular book that was perfect for her course and fitting that into the syllabus. And we were brainstorming about how she could potentially write about this for teaching sociology. Because most disciplines have a journal that's specifically focused on the pedagogy within that discipline, right? Mm -hmm. So I said, what if you used track changes in your syllabus? So if you are starting with redesigning and you just keep track of all of the changes that you make in your syllabus and attach a couple of comments every time you make a change for why you are making that change. It's automatically stamped with a date. So you can see the progression of your ideas over time as you're making the revisions to the syllabus. And then if you give that syllabus to a student or a colleague for their feedback, and have them attach their comments, still tracking changes, then you basically have a record over time within you know, however long you're working on the syllabus of what changes you made and why, which could then be connected to an analysis of the impact of those changes when you do the thing that you're planning. And you would have been making those changes to your syllabus anyway. And when we track changes, we just say, accept all. <laughs> right? yeah. Like, ta-da, I'm done. But what if we actually made those changes visible and made it a part of um, excavating the process involved in doing the work of putting more experiential learning opportunities into the course? I would be very excited to have other suggestions that might make sense. So I'm going to tell you about the ELO that I'm currently implementing this semester in my course, CEE 492. And so this is a brand new course. This is the first semester it's been offered. So it's been lots of figuring out what's going on in addition to the ELO just for the whole course. This is a required course. All of our elementary education majors have to take it because they all get dual certified in elementary and early childhood education. So I do have quite a few students who are not super into the idea of teaching in early childhood education. They think they want to teach older students and they're a little bit annoyed that they have to take this course. So I've got that going on. Um, we also meet at a local elementary school at Tuscaloosa City Elementary School which has been really great. The school gave us a classroom that we can use every week. 
And so we've kind of got multiple levels of ELOs going on. Uh, the fact that we're meeting at a school is not part of my particular learning and action project, but it's been a great advantage because the students can kind of hear me lecture, then they go into pre-kindergarten classrooms and observe and participate, and then we come back to the classroom and talk about what they saw in addition to everything else we're doing. And so the goal of this course, and one reason why we wanted to add it, is because we wanted to do a better job as a program of helping students kind of build their professional identity and specifically learn about families and how you interact with families as a teacher. So we've got a lot of courses that are specific to, you know, how to teach literacy, how to teach math, how to do classroom management, but we had not intentionally focused on relationships with families. So my particular ELO, I partnered with Help Me Grow Alabama, which is a state organization focused on early childhood development and helping families get information about their child's development. They put on events in the community called Books, Balls, and Blocks. So basically, uh, Help Me Grow picks a place to have this event. They invite families to come. Families bring their children who are five years old and under. There's stations set up for the children to play, walk on a balance beam, cut with scissors. And while the children do this, the families fill out the ages and stages questionnaire, which is a developmental screening. And so then right on site, they can fill out this ASQ. They can walk around and see their child cutting with scissors because that's a popular one that parents will say, well, I've never allowed my child to have scissors before, so I don't really know if they can cut. So then the, the students who are helping with this event can say, oh, well, let's walk right over here and we can see how your child does with this. And so then the volunteers <laughs> on site can score these questionnaires and share the results with families. And if there are any areas where the child scores below benchmark, uh, so it scores like gross motor skills, fine motor skills, communication, then there are agencies right on site that uh, we can make a referral to the family. So we can say, you know, here are my friends from early intervention. I'm gonna walk you over there and you know, maybe they can give you a call sometime. So it all happens right there at the event. And so Help Me Grow does these and they need volunteers. So that's where my students came in, that they could be the volunteers. Um, our students do not have to take a course in child development currently which is somewhat of a limitation for them. So we piece together child development knowledge when we can, but through the students having to learn about this ages and stages questionnaire, they had to learn child development milestones. So they got really a document that said, for a child who's 36 months, here's what's typically expected. And if you're not able to do these things, you might be behind. And you might benefit from a referral. So that was a knowledge point for my students right there. They got to engage with a diverse population. We did these events in uh, public housing communities in Northport. And they had the ex experience or the potential experience to actually share the results with families, which was very nerve wracking mm -hmm. to my students. So the outcomes, uh, like I talked about, we're trying to build their knowledge of typical child development. We want to help them gain confidence that they can communicate with families kind of as that professional, uh, that they can do that in a culturally responsive, strengths-based way, and that they build their professional identity, that they start to see themselves as teachers, as knowledgeable professionals. They're about a year out from student teaching, and then they will potentially have their own classroom. So now's the time to start doing that, and that's a big shift for a lot of them. So as far as problem-solving skills, they got to act as the experts at this event. So Help Me Grow staff was there, was close by, and we talked about before the events, if you feel uncomfortable or if you get a particularly um, 
you know, a set of results that you're really not sure how to communicate this, Healthy Grow's right here and, and you can defer to them. But I encourage them, you know, you have the knowledge and, and the skills and the practice that you can do this, but they're close by if you need them. Uh, in class, we did a lot of role playing to help them prepare. So we started out where I would give them scenarios. So I gave them some instances like, what would you say if a parent said, uh, I know my child isn't talking yet, but some children just talk late. So, you know, I'm not super concerned, you know, it'll just work itself out. What might you say to a parent who says that? And then I would give them examples of, you know, do you think uh, this would be a good way to share results, or could you say this in a different way? Jason is behind. He can't do what other kids his age can. So starting off from that place where they're able to say, like, oh, I know that that's not a good way to say it, but I'm not really sure what I should say instead. So practicing that and then moving to role playing where I just gave them a questionnaire, they had to score it, and then another student acted as the parent, and they got to share the results. So all of that leading up to the big event. So before the event, some things my students were saying. Um, one student raised her hand and she said, I've been thinking, are you sure we're qualified to do this? And I just thought that was such a good, I was so excited by that question. Um, because that showed they're taking this seriously. Uh, but also, you know, but then we had a conversation, if you're not qualified now, kind of when will you be? You know, you'll get a diploma, but really nothing is going to happen between now and then that's going to necessarily make you more qualified to do this. You've had a lot of practice, you've had a lot of support, like you're ready to do this. Um, and then similarly, I'm feeling nervous about this, am I supposed to feel this way? And just that idea that for beginning teachers, working with parents can be very stressful. So as far as assessment, they were assessed on are they able to score this questionnaire, follow the scoring guidelines, it's not too complicated, and then are they able to interpret the results to find these are the places where I would potentially um, make a referral or I would give a parent just more resources about what they could do. So are they able to do that? <coughs> then in class and at the event, are they actively participating? Are they engaging with families and getting outside their comfort zone? We talked about how to use the problem-solving model to identify and then think through how they solve problems. So kind of anticipated problems that might happen. And then actually, after the event, which we just had the past two weeks, um, what challenges did they face and how did they address them? And then we are doing in-class group discussions, and they'll also complete a written reflection for me to grade in addition to the one that they'll do in task street, where they can think about how this fits into their own professional goals of what they want to do after they graduate. Here are a couple photos. So uh, it was a very interactive event. So one of the highlights was really uh, just seeing students engage with the children and the families who came. Uh, it was grandparents who brought their children. Uh, the grandparents were just really happy to be able to sit back and have a break and see their children happy and um, getting a lot of individual attention. Uh, and the, the students did a great job and were very highly engaged. So some challenges and things that I'm thinking about as far as implementing this in the future, we did not have good attendance at our events, which we, which I was very prepared for. Uh, the, the challenge is we're really trying to reach a population that does not necessarily access other services. So we made an intentional choice. We're not pairing this with, with pre-K or Head Start because we know those children already are doing screenings and have access to services. We're trying to reach children that don't attend any kind of formal early child care uh, until they're in kindergarten. So that's a challenge to find them and to get them to come. So we're thinking about how could that be better in the future because that's directly tied to my students, the quality of the experience that they have. 
related. Not all students had the chance to share assessment results with families. They were all prepared to going in because they thought they were going to have to, but they didn't actually get that real experience. And then for me, thinking about how can I really facilitate good reflection, given that they've had kind of these uh, diverse experiences, and just the challenge of getting them to think deeply, you know, especially about the attendance. For, for the, my students, that seems like a fairly straightforward thing. He said, well, the event must not have been at a good time of day. So, yeah, you know, how did at a different time more people would have come? So for us to talk through, well, what, you know, what about this, what about this, uh, to get them to think more deeply and think about all the complex factors that are at work. Um, I'm, I'm thinking now about how I might keep this going next year. I'm not going to be teaching this particular course, but I work closely with the people who are, so I think there's a lot of potential. And then uh, thinking about how to engage more community partners, especially before the event. At the event, my students had the opportunity to meet people from organizations like Parents as Teachers and Tuscaloosa One Place. My students had no idea what those partners were or what they did. So that was a good experience. I think we could potentially get them more involved as well. So I will stop there and take questions later. Thank you. Uh, my name is Armin Emmerkanian. I'm in the Civil Engineering Department. And I teach a required course for all Civil Engineering um, students. We have four accredited degrees. You can be a graduate of civil, construction, environmental, or architectural engineering, but all four of those degree programs have to take CE 262, which is the introduction to all materials used in civil engineering. Kind of makes sense. All those different engineers are going to use some type of material, and so I cover that. In addition to that, and what kind of led me to develop this um, activity was um, the desire to have the students actually have some, as much as possible, real world experience and uh, practice. I am a licensed professional engineer in the state of Alabama and three other states. And so I've been on a lot of projects. I've seen a lot of like actual stuff in the job site. I'm trying to bring that to the classroom. And the activity I introduced to the course, which, funny enough, already has experiential learning because it already has a lab section associated with it. So we could call it done. I guess I'm a great experiential teacher because I have a lab section associated with the course. But historically, the labs that we do, which are soils, asphalt mix design, concrete mix design, and steel strength testing, were all very um, prescribed. Students got a handout, followed the steps, did the experiment, wrote a report. So we decided to change that for the concrete mix design process. That's the area of my research, so it's the area I'm most comfortable starting with tinkering. And it started out just being, okay, we're gonna have like groups, they're gonna mix, and then other uh, groups in the lab section will inspect the concrete and so forth. And then I met with the guy, Jay. Yes, met with Jay. And he put this idea in my head, learn before label. I thought that was great. So kind of on the fly, last year when I taught this the first time, um, we stuck in an extra lab prior to the planned lab. There are 96 students in this course. There are four lab sections that meet every week. Each lab section has anywhere from 22 to 30 students. So a lot of concrete gets mixed. But I told the lab manager, don't worry, just make a bigger dumpster, because we're gonna mix a whole nother week of concrete. So the first week, I purposely set the schedule in the course, in the lecture portion, to not cover anything about concrete until after this first lab. So when they showed up to lab, I handed them a sheet of paper that just said how to mix it. Like, 
Add the aggregate, water, mix for 30 seconds, add the cement, mix for three minutes, hold for two, mix for another three. That's all they got. There were no weights. There was no other instructions. They didn't even know where the concrete lab was. We showed them. And in the lab, we showed them the mixer, the aggregate, where the hose was, and the bucket of cement. They said, all right, go mix. And so they had no knowledge of how much of each material to add to the mixer. Now, a few of the students had interned prior to this and had been on a job site where a concrete truck showed up. They at least knew what good concrete should look like. <laughs> and there is an old um, rule of thumb, and it's shockingly still used today sometimes. So I haven't even seen it used on campus. I won't say where. Um, where if you take three shovels of coarse aggregate, two shovels of sand, and one shovel of cement, and add water, you can get concrete. So a few of the groups knew that and tried that. It didn't, it didn't work out. That's OK to learn. But the majority of the groups ended up with something that did not look like concrete. And did any of you mix concrete people? I know, yeah, you mixed it. I showed my co cohort how to mix concrete in the lab. So that was fun. Not as easy as it looks. No. And the hardest part is you don't need a lot of water. That is a shockingly small amount of water that's needed to make concrete. So all but two groups in the entire 96 students had way too much water. So much that it washed all the cement out and you just had like water and rocks. <laughs> now, the key thing was I told them they don't have to write anything down. This is not going in their lab report and just to have fun. I also um, gave them a little survey prior to this just to kind of have a baseline feel for what they are expecting and I'm in the process of getting data for after it in addition to the task stream stuff that's uh, part of this experiential learning process. So they did that and then the following week in class we talked about concrete mix design we showed them how to do the calculations, and a lot of them very quickly realized, oh yeah, there's a lot less water than I added. And one student, he almost got it. He knew that there's something called a water-cement ratio, and 0.5 or half, that's, a, that's not a bad one. And so he was, by hand, just guessing, oh, that weighs about this, this weighs about this, it's about half except he weighed aggregates and cement, and that ratio is just the cement. So he was still wrong. But he had the right idea. <laughs> he had heard that number and was trying to put it together without knowing anything about it. So the following week, after they've learned how to do the mix design the correct way, they show up to lab. I have a, a little worksheet that kind of guides them because no one prepares before lab. If I give it to them, they'll still show up with the blank sheet and do it in lab. So I just kind of prepared myself for that. And half of the groups in each lab section designed the concrete mixture <coughs> that they think would be good. The other half watched a few videos on three tests that we do on fresh concrete to see if it's good or not. And the timing actually worked out nicely. It takes students about 10 minutes to go through a mix design, and the videos were three minutes long each. So they actually all ended pretty much at the same time, walked into concrete lab. The design concrete group, or the contractors, they mixed, well, they weighed out, mixed their concrete while the inspectors watched. After the concrete was mixed, the inspectors took over and actually did the three measurements on it to see if they met the requirements. So I gave them some target values that they had to hit for air content, unit weight, and slump. Inspectors recorded their numbers, handed it to the contractor group so they could write their report. The following week, the roles reversed. The guys that were inspecting now are designing concrete mix, 
and vice versa. Obviously, the third week went way faster because now everyone has seen where everything is in the lab and seemed to go pretty well. And in addition to the SACS accreditation that the whole university goes through, engineering programs are accredited by ABED. And this particular course has to meet two of the seven ABED criteria. Ability to communicate effectively and ability to develop and conduct appropriate experimentation. Their communication was their lab report, where they had to discuss what they did. But more importantly is outcome six, develop and conduct appropriate experimentation. Because they were only given design targets for their concrete mix design, they had to develop a mix design and conduct the actual mixing process. It was not a lab, which has sometimes been done in the past, where the TA stands in front of the class, mixes everything for them, and everyone just watches. They had to do it themselves. So we really gave them a chance to experience um, experimentation. And then later they analyze and interpret the results they have. And they used engineering judgment to say how, if they had a chance to mix again, they would improve their mix. Because only one out of the 26 groups got all their design targets, which is kind of expected. The concrete mix design process is a little bit tedious if you have no prior experience. And throughout this process, I mentioned, I kind of stuck in at the last minute this learn before label idea. I think it worked really well. Some of the students were very skeptical until I repeatedly, and like almost individually, told them, it doesn't matter what you make. You're not going to get a grade on this. You could literally, if you wanted to, just say, oh, I mixed it and walk out of lab and call it good. Surprisingly, no one did that. They actually stayed in there. But we removed the idea of, all right, here's a set of steps. You don't have to think. You just have to, okay, did that, did that. And they were actually actively thinking as they were doing the lab. Unfortunately for all the other labs we've done this semester, they're still not actively thinking. Working on making all the labs more active. And I think the most important part of this, because it is a 200 level course, most of them are sophomores, most of them are juniors that they tell me because they have enough credit hours and they're super good AP students, and this is the hardest class they've ever taken and the lowest homework grade they ever got in their life and their life is falling apart. <laughs> I tried to remove the fear of failure. Up until this point in their curriculum, the only labs they've taken were chemistry and physics. Are there any chemistry or physics? I had some of the students explain to me what chemistry and physics labs are like here. I was very surprised. Um, I thought there was more active stuff going on. I guess it wasn't like when I took physics and chemistry in undergrad. So they haven't really done anything. They don't write lab reports according to students, in chemistry and physics. They do the experiment, fill out a worksheet or something in lab, turn it in, it gets graded, but they don't have to go home basically and think about what they did and write about it. So again, for this course, this is the first time they have to do that. So they're really worried about failing. And so for this part of the course, I've tried to remove that fear of failing by starting the concrete mix design process with no deliverable. They just had to do the activity to get a feel for it. And as part of this, and it kind of developed over the past year, there are two instructors that regularly teach this course, myself and another instructor. The other instructor is extremely um, recipe 
days. I'm trying to think of a good way to say it. He follows instructions precisely. He teaches the same course every single semester as he has been for 25 years. I don't think anything has changed since he started teaching this course. So I'm curious, I've almost convinced them to adopt, at least for the concrete portion of the laboratory uh, section, this idea of the three-week lab. And so I'm kind of curious, how do students respond when they're being taught in lecture? It's a very different way than I'm teaching. And then also every semester, usually the TA that's assigned to the course changes. It ranges from a TA that has like who worked in a concrete ready mix yard to a TA that's never mixed concrete before. So we have a wide variety of skill sets in the actual uh, students that are teaching this part of the course in the lab. And maybe as part of a study looking at uh, outcomes if the concrete mixing lab was taught in a recipe based approach compared to how we've done it this semester. And this course covers not only concrete, but these other materials. And it would be very easy, in my opinion, to adopt that process to all of this. It's just a matter of convincing the other faculty member to consider it as well. Um, as you probably guess, students talk. And my course this semester was only supposed to have like 80 students, but apparently word got out that I'm teaching it in this way. And someone's higher up than me allowed 16 more students in the course, which overloaded the labs because no one has a concept of how many students can actually physically fit in the lab. And I have no say in that. Um, but trying to adopt this to the whole course I think would be beneficial. Every single civil engineering student has to go through this course at some point. And it would be, I think, helpful. Another thing that I coupled with this specific activity, because we're covering a very distinct set of materials that seemingly aren't related, the way the course is typically taught, and I've taught previously, is now, okay, we're going to talk all about aggregates, then go to soils, then cover concrete, asphalt, steel, and wood. What I've done this semester is something called spiral curriculum type of thing, where for the first third of the course, we covered all these materials, but just talked about how they're classified. This current middle third of the course, we're talking about how we do the mixed designs for all these materials. And the third third of the course, we're going to cover how do you evaluate the strength of all these materials. So each third of the semester, they see all the materials, as opposed to how it was previously taught, where after the first two weeks, we never talk about aggregates again, until maybe the final exam. So we're coupling that with this experiential activity and I've been very fortunate. I have two students in the course who took it with me last year that dropped, actually right around now, before the last day to drop with the W. And they're in it this semester, and they say they definitely are learning way better by covering all the materials constantly through the semester than how I taught it last year. So I have been able to get at least two data points of feedback on how that uh, works. And they actually did experience, they were still there when we did the concrete mixing lab last year, and they said this year it ran a little bit better, because I learned a lot <laughs> on how to do it better. And that's pretty much it. First is Gadsden Center. I'm also an adjunct professor in the New College Live Track program. Those that are not familiar with New College Life Track, uh, it is a, a non-traditional program uh, that is geared to degree completion. People that come to the uh, program usually have a, uh, we'll say, a checkered academic past. Uh, they may have had a, quite a bit of work or military uh, training. 
that they can have converted into academic credit. But, so we have more of a non-traditional slant. Uh, and I work, I focus more in the area of uh, Southern history and historical archaeology. I do a lot of cemetery preservation classes. Uh, I'm, I'm solidly a 19th century guy, so that's the time period that I'm kind of looking at. We go out, we look at the, uh, the stones, we help prepare the stones with the grave markers. Um, but there's symbols on the, the stones. There's a lot of things that today genealogists, today historians, that kind of can tell the direction. And through this process, I get a lot of questions. A lot of them dealing with, uh, or, or implied questions, in that a lot of it deals with people's fear of death, or they, they, they get this, this kind of morbid sensibility about being in a cemetery and being around a lot of dead folks. So my course, which is still in the hopper, it's still being uh, uh, slotted for, for scheduling, is biting the big one, a candid discussion about many uh, shedding the mortal coil. And I wanted to get to that. Uh, I do not have the typical 18 to 22 year old undergraduate students. My, my students typically have have a little more mileage on them. Uh, life has scarred them up in different ways. But so we have a chance to, to discuss different uh, venues with them. Uh, that death is a great equalizer. And every living creature on this earth has to experience the end of their physical life on this planet in some form or fashion. We, we know as humans or we think that humans are really the only ones that have that tie any significance or importance to the concept of death. Other creatures typically don't do that. For humans, that that process is at once the most shared experience we can have, but can, is also the most solitary in that we all die alone in some form or fashion. So, what are those perceptions like? And we know that in different cultures that there's a myriad of behaviors and actions and traditions that we follow that underscore the importance of that that process uh, that we help the person to uh, in their transition from this from this physical world but since the uh, since embalming in this country became more prevalent following the Civil War we have lost our personal connection with death. Uh, in the past, I'll go back a slide, you see all of these things that families did. Families and communities took care of everything. You did not have a institutionalized funeral industry. But with the, uh, the, the ability now to embalm in a reasonable fashion, this process has become more sterile. We've become more distant from it. Uh, not only do we, where in the past, uh, people died at home for the most part, now the vast majority of people die in the hospital or another type of institution, whether it's a nursing home or something of like that, uh, that sort. But, you know, we, we don't have any connection with that. Uh, if we if plan funerals, it's a one-stop shop. Funeral home makes it very easy to come in. Hey, look, we'll take care of everything. We're going to open and close the grave. We'll take care of the ceremony. We'll do everything you need to do. You don't have to do anything else. Okay. So what I want my students to do is to really embrace the idea of death. I'm not advocating going back to us digging our own graves <laughs> or having a cool one sitting in the living room or in the parlor. If you've ever heard the term sitting up with the dead, that's where that process, that term comes from. But I want them to become familiar with what has happened in the past and how that affects them as individuals. So, 
take hold of those beliefs and engage in it, take it into them, really take it into themselves and really identify what it is they truly believe, what kind of fears and apprehensions do they have, and what can we learn from the process. Hey, I want them to learn how to best distinguish between uh, the objective and subjective portions of this. They can go out and learn. They can explore different avenues, different cultures, maybe a culture from their, their ancestors. They can do research on that. But they also have to go in and take a look at themselves. What do they really believe? What are they really scared of? A lot of people, you know, I said I do a lot of, in cemeteries, a lot of people don't want to go in cemeteries. It's just, at least in the beginning, it's morbid to them. But once you get them out there, they find it fascinating of what they can learn. Okay? Uh, our learners are, uh, they're expected to uh, go out and research. Research on your, uh, your, your culture, if you want to. Or go to another culture if you're interested in how others deal with death, other religious beliefs. Some people tie a lot of significance, religious or spiritual significance to death, while others don't. Some more, it's, sometimes it's more pragmatic. Uh, do the research on that. Then I want them to go out and write an initial paper on what, what their their fears and apprehensions are. And reflect on, on what's really going on inside. I don't care what you were taught as a kid. I don't care what the way you were brought up. What do you really feel? What do you really fear? Okay? Then I want them to go out and do an interview. A very extensive interview. And they can pick somebody that has that is closely involved with death on a daily basis. It can be a police officer, a firefighter, it can be a coroner, uh, a priest, pastor, a rabbi. It doesn't matter. You find someone who deals with death on a daily basis. Find out what, how do they cope with that? That's a heavy burden for anybody to carry on a day-to-day -day basis. How do they deal with it? What do they do to uh, be able to live a normal life? while dealing with that uh, with their patients or uh, members of their, their congregation, whatever the case might be. Okay, now, then I want the learner to go back and say, well, how were you affected? What did you learn from this, from the interview? What did you uh, experience? What kind of things did this shake up in your psyche about how you think about things? And I want them to take three, three rows of this. I want to take the descriptive, which really lays out the environment of the, the interview. What, what's the conditions under which that other person is working? Okay. I want them to reflect on, on things that were meaningful or very moving to them, were disturbing, that, that maybe they didn't find or, or didn't anticipate happening. And then in a synthesis, I want them to bring everything together, combine the two, and try to make sense of the entire process. Okay? Then I want them to go out, take that first paper they wrote on what they fear and what they're concerned about. I want them to revisit it. Now that you've gone this, through this interview, now that you've gone through this entire process, go back and now let's rethink it. And has your mindset changed? Has your way of, way of thinking changed? You know, have you questioned, do you question your own beliefs? Whatever the case may be. Then as an extra credit piece, I want them to uh, have the opportunity to write their own obituary. Now this is going to be kind of fun. <laughs> now, sometimes you're going to get the, the cookie cutter obituary that you see in the paper. But for the most part, I want them to take some, take some, take some risk with the obituary. All right, what did you learn about death in, in your cells that you want to factor into that piece? 
And that's more of a subtle piece. That's in the, in the under, underpinnings of it. You really don't want to say, well, you know, I learned now that I'm not, you know, not, not as afraid of death because of this, and have that in the obituary. That's not what I'm referring to. But have them incorporate those, those changes in that obituary. And what do they want others to know about themselves that but they might not otherwise have known? You know, educate people about your life. Because not all of us are in, con in, in contact with the same people on a daily basis. Describe events or accomplishments of note. And things that you were still working on and were passionate about. What about bucket list items? What things did you do that you really wanted to do, that you found that, that, that you were passionate about and really wanted to get done and did? What things were you still working on? And lastly, consider giving some kind of final shot, parting, parting shot to the world. This is your final press release. You get this is it. You get a chance to talk to people and tell people what you think. But I do put the point is, look, let's let's not be stupid about it. <laughs> I did see one recently. It was out of, a, out of a New England paper. And apparently the, the guy that passed away was a, a, just a, a unrepentant prankster. And his two daughters wrote the obituary. And on the, on the front side, you look at it, if you read just the words, they dogged their dad all the way into the grave. But you really saw in that description their great appreciation for his sense of humor. But they were throwing it back at him. So, anyway, this is, this is where we're at. Uh, some of the challenges, getting people to talk about it honestly. We, we, uh, Heather, Heather knows, we, we test, did a little test with this. We wanted to try to bring in uh, people that are uh, or members of our Ollie group. Uh, Ollie, for, for those that don't know, are, are more or less senior uh, people who just want to learn for the love of learning. And they tend to be over 50. So we said, okay, that'll be a good market. That'll, that'll be a good test group. <laughs> Absolutely not. They did not want, no, I don't want to talk about them. I, uh, we're not going to talk about this. So, Maybe getting some younger participants might give them a little more flexibility. And also, re the reluctance of some people to talk honestly about death and what they really fear. A lot of people keep a step up or live. They're going to play the party line. Look, I was, I was raised in this particular church. This is what we believe. This is Now, they will tell you whether they really believe that or not. This is what I was taught. This is, this is the story I'm sticking with. So I think it gives people an opportunity to really explore an inevitable part of what's going to happen to all of us and give us a chance to grow. So with that, thank you.